All right, welcome everyone. So today we're very happy to have our own Julia Isabella, uh, our new postdoc. So if you haven't met her yet, please uh, come say hello after the talk, but otherwise please take it away. Okay, thank you. So for today's talk, I decided to tell you a bit about econo scattering, and I decided this for a few reasons. One is very selfish, is because I, I like it. It's like a topic that I find interesting, and I feel like I learned a lot of physics working on this. And it's also a regime, a kinematic regime that is relevant in a lot of physical setups. It has been studied for quantum mechanics, for string theory, for QED, and, and so on. So I think it's something that is interesting to know. Uh, the second reason is that in the recent years, we've seen like tremendous effort going into pushing the state of the art in uh, the subject of gravitational waves, and uh, which is very impressive. And I think it's good to have like a parallel effort to really understand the, the framework that we're using in order to compute these observables and so on. And I wanted to give you a very simple example of this. It's socially accepted that we can use the ask scattering amplitudes to predict the motion of like a physical object. This is something that we do every day. We compute, we match to uh, GR and everything works. But when you think about it, this is a pretty incredible thing because amplitudes are a perturbative calculation. And if a perturbative calculation is a small uh, dimensionless parameter. What is the small dimensionless parameter in gravity? Well, you have G, G Newton, which is dimensions. And uh, it turns out that the dimensionless parameter is G times the energy of the scattering squared, okay? which is basically E over F Planck. Now you see immediately that if you scatter in some Transplankian object, then uh, your, your small parameter is not small anymore. So what we're doing is basically doing some perturbative calculation and then extrapolating it way beyond this regime of uh, validity uh, for like a very large um, you know, parameter. Now, because you know we are just Planck and astrophysical objects are like very, very just And um, So this means that we are somehow summing an infinity of diagrams when we do that. And, uh, and I think it's important to really make sure we understand what we mean by that. So like uh, how those things uh, resum, uh, how this resummation works when we have spins, uh, how this resummation works when we go to sublinear effects. I think it's, it's important to put some effort into that as well. So Good. for astrophysics, we spent an RS over B. So that's a dimensionless one. I will clarify this, what I mean. When you have well, like- There's a Q involved too, right? I know, I know. Because we also have a large B. And uh, yes, I will explain this. So like uh, the corner regime is something that allows us to understand exactly why we are able to extrapolate a large uh, G time best. When you compute this, yes, a parameter is alpha, like a G time best. And this is larger than one. So in principle, you are yourself. I would like But you still have a small time. Yes, I will, I will talk about this. Okay, so this is like a, one aspect of it. And the last uh, reason why I'm uh, talking about this is because I think there's still like, stuff to do in this direction and to understand. And I'm trying to push it uh, further. And I, I, I know that all the people here work in, for instance, like large spins. Uh, and I hope to start a bit of a conversation with some people here in order to see if uh, this makes sense or, you know, if you want to give me some feedback, etc. Okay, so these are the motivations. So if you're not familiar with what I mean by kind of scattering, the picture to have in mind during this talk uh, is the following. So we're going to scatter some objects for today's Halloween, so put pumpkins, but whatever object you want, you can scatter. It comes from uh, asymptotic infinity. And then uh, uh, the idea is that those objects are very largely separated. So when I talk about a corner scatter, I really mean that these objects have a very large hyperparameter. And then they scatter each other, they interact, uh, for instance, gravitationally, and then they have a small deflection angle theta. Uh, this is just to set up the notation. I'm going to work in the center mass frame, and those are like usual, um, you know, bunks of variable SMT. OK. So when I say econo regime, what I mean is really, oh no, I'm going to take some incoming momentum, which can be very large. Okay, so center of mass energy can be very large, and B is also very large. So something else that becomes very large when both uh, B and uh, momentum are large is the, the angular momentum. Okay, so what I'm going to take is like large angular momentum, I'm going to L, which is basically P times B, okay, the classical one. 
And, uh, and uh, because the things are very far away, then also take a look small. Okay, so the plan for today's talk is the following. First of all, I will uh, clarify how we take this limit from scattering amplitudes, because amplitudes are no eigenstates of angular momentum. So how do we really take this large L limit of amplitudes? And uh, the way to do that is going to be through uh, partial waves. So how do we recover this icono from amplitudes? So let's say amplitudes with some icono formula. No. And then, and this will be general, doesn't matter which theory you're interested in. And then the second part, I will focus on observables. And then I will uh, restrict to gravity. And here, something that you can immediately think of is the fact that when you scatter around, when you compute amplitudes, what you're really scattering is like plane waves in a position space, right? So, but here I'm saying, talking about an object that is localized, a certain B. So, like, there's some wave packets that needs to go into this problem. And, like, how small can you take these wave packets? How, like, can you talk meaningfully about a particular trajectory? So, this is like the plan for today. Okay. And um, please interrupt me if there's any questions. So, are you talking about conservative dynamics or are yes. you also including radiation? So, Including radiation and including large spins is something that I'd like to understand better. But so far, what I'm going to talk about is two. two. Like radiation will enter in the imaginary part of the phase shift, but I'm not going to consider it as an external state. OK, so as I said, we want to take the larger L limit of scattering amplitude. So we need to introduce it somehow. And the way we're going to do this is through uh, using par uh, partial waves. So what are partial waves? Let me just write down the partial wave decomposition of an amplitude, which is a function of the four incoming momenta. And I'm also going to consider external state with spin. So there's like a bunch of uh, helicity uh, indices, OK? So partial wave decomposition, let me first write it down. So it's like some normalization. And then two, four, nango, spin. So when we do uh, scattering amplitudes, as I said, we scatter in a two to two state, which is a tensor product of two one particle states, which are irreps of one carry. Now, uh, the tensor product is not an irrep of one carry. Okay. So what we do is that basically we project this on uh, like two particle state on uh, one particle state, which has a which will have the same momenta p. But as we're working in the center of mass energy, when we take p1 dot plus p2, you get something that's like E000. So this has like a SO3 symmetry, and you can construct the irreps of, of the dot. Okay. Uh, so you're gonna have a certain angular momentum L. Now, when you do this procedure and just insert a complete set of those one particle states in your amplitudes, this is what you get. This, uh, if you do it in, uh, when you scatter scalars, this is a uh, Legion polynomials. You might have encountered them before. And if you have spins, uh, this uh, is, uh, becomes a bit more complicated function, but it's, uh, it's called a big nerd. But it's basically when you set those two, zero is a. Uh, um, it's a Legion polynomial. Okay. So maybe let me just run that there is the difference. Of Okay, so what is the intuition of what we're going to do? Now what we want to do is take the larger limit. And then you see, when you uh, do this expansion, L is a sum. So it's a, it's a discrete sum. While well, here, when we talk about this classical uh, scenario, L becomes a continuous parameter, okay? because it's like a classical angular momentum. So somehow taking this larger limit, we should recover some continuous uh, limit. Okay. So the intuition here, and then I'll show you a bit better what the calculation is, is the following. So we said that um, when we project on one particle states, those have some SO3 symmetry, okay? Because it's a vector that is like in zero, 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 so you can do rotation on the spatial part and then classify your states because of this, okay? Now, 
<clears throat> and so three, maybe, maybe quick yes. question. Uh, what, and but what, what do you do about the teacher on call? Do you do something about it? Or like, um, like no, level? I'm just like that. I mean, it's not well defined, right? In for the for gravity, no, but like, we're going to take it okay. as well. Yeah. There's also like some uh, generalization of this in D dimension that would be nice okay. to see this. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. So, uh, SO3, I mean, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, what I was saying is like uh, SO3 is the symmetry of your uh, center of mass vector. Okay. And it's the isometry of a sphere. You can rotate the sphere of a sphere. So, you want it, it's going to stay the same. Now, what happens when you take the large angular momentum limit of a sphere? You're on a sphere and this like has very large radius or turns very fast, and it looks like a plane. That is the reason why the Earth looks flat. So when you take the larger L limit, what you're actually observing is a, a, a contraction of this group into R2, which is basically just like a U1. Uh, rotation and then a two translation. Okay, so you go from the sphere to a plane. Now, why am I saying this? This sphere is a compact um, space, okay? And we know from group theory that like a compact space, we have like finite dimensional irreducible representations. You know, when you do a, a representation of S to three, you go from like minus S to S, S two S plus one states, a finite number. On the other hand, the plane is, uh, is not compact, okay? So this is finite dimensional, ellipse. And this has an infinite dimensional one, which can also be written as continuous, it reduces the representation, okay? Do you have to be careful with the spin structure because, like, you're you're allowing like half integer spin exchanges, I assume, right? Um, because I could have a scalar. I you should have allow a scalar and a fermion scattering of one another. Yeah, and that should have like half integer. Yeah, but that's fine. Ah, uh, you mean like? I should um, be spin, right? But... No, I don't think it's a problem because like this is just the 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 reps of. The central mass vector. This works also for. Yeah. Yeah, no, it shouldn't work. But we can look at this more in detail. But it works also for fermions. Okay, so one comment I wanted to that's basically how we see the emergence of the classical limit. How we see the emergence of the, the continuous uh, inter, like interparameter from a, like a geometrical perspective, which I think is pretty nice. Also, notice that this is the same contractor that happens when you take the masses limit. If you start from a massive uh, irreps of one carré, you take the masses limit, you end up in uh, iso two. But usually, what we do is like we throw away the i because we don't observe any continuous spin in nature, and then we end up with just u one, which is the massless. Uh, particles, but then like here, like I was very satisfied because like I have a physical intuition of what the I is it's really like classical limit. Okay, so this is the intuition behind what I'm going to show you. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. Okay, so I want to take the larger limit of this expression. Let me first focus on what the larger limit of the Wigner is. And for that, let me just write this basically what this is. So we're scattering states which have a definite uh, helicity and uh, angular momentum, L. And this is just the result of scattering some uh, final state which is rotated with respect to the initial one. Okay, that's how you get this. Uh, this is a, a rotation in J2 in the water direction. Okay? So do, can you talk about the arrow yes. then? Like, what does it mean to not fully be in the limit? Like, what if I wanted to be correct? Yeah, so 
we have control over corrections, and it turns out that those are like um, purely uh, um, quantum gravity type of corrections. So we have control over like I mean, let me let me show you. Let's say classical, like when you say you take the large angular momentum. Yes. Um, all of classical is in that limit. There's no there's no one or the other corrections. There are those corrections, but you can check how big those are, and there's like all the quantum graphical corrections. Okay. And the this SO3 to ISO2, this is just like how to see the continuum, but in practice, does it imply anything about the scattering, like the fact that, you know, as you start to comment that ISO2 corresponds to um, massless particles, basically on the light cone? Like, yeah. Aside from the story of. This uh, is what allows you to recover the Fourier transform. To go to this space. I'm about to, to show you the, the, the details, but and basically somehow like if you want to end up talking about this problem, there should be a Fourier transfer that bring it from, from T or Q squared is J momentum to B. And that's how you you see the emergence of that in this limit. So one last question. So E comma zero 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 is the SO3. Yeah. So ISO2 I assume is like Rotations on x y, it's like I don't know, p zero zero p. What does that mean? Um, like, I don't know. Yeah, about I don't it. know how to say it that way. Okay, so there's no, there's no. Because uh, you motivated SO three by saying the representation of the center of mass. I'm just wondering, like, all right, so the the corresponding vector would be. E zero zero e. What is that? I, 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 I yeah, I wouldn't see it that way. Okay. It's more about yeah. Let me can I just yeah, yeah. show you a few more lines and then we can discuss this again. Okay. So okay, so let me just show you more precisely how this thing happens. So we starting from SO3, just let me just quickly write down what the relations are for this. We have three generators. Okay, they're charged two of those are the raising and lowering operators, and those are combination of one and two, which are rotation to uh, around the x and y axis. Okay. Then uh, two plus two minus three. And uh, those states that I wrote are, I guess, states of the three. We, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, we quantize around the, the z-axis. And then the most important relation that I want to show you is what happens if you act with a lowering and, and a, a raising operator on this. And this is what you get, right? One of the state which has been raised over by this raising over operator. Now, what happens when you take the larger limit? In particular, when you take the L, which is larger than the external state's uh, helicity. Okay? So you take the limit where lambda over L is much smaller than one, and this becomes, um, well, you're dominated by the Casimir here, L plus one, and then. This last corrections. And uh, let me mention that these corrections are known, so you can actually like, check how big they are. Also notice that I think this, this limit is important also when we talk about like large spins. So when we are interested in like scattering curved black holes, for instance, we always want them to be separated enough so that this argument goes through. Okay, this uh, side to side comment. Okay, so what happens when we take this limit? Basically acting on the lowering and uh, raising operator, here you see they they commute. Okay, you can go up and down and you can keep going up and there's no nothing that then stops you to keep going up. Okay, that's where the infinite dimensional uh, representation comes from. Okay, and that's where the uh, ISO2 comes from because now what happens is that, what happens is that those two commute, 
right? Because we can act with them one or the other, and it doesn't matter the order. And uh, these become the generators of the translation, okay? We can translate in the right or the other, and it's mute. And the rest basically uh, stay the same. So that's how we get that. Okay. Now, what we want to do, so this is what happens to this state uh, under J2 once we take uh, this uh, large L link. Now, what would be very nice if we had some states here that are eigenstates of J2, okay? And J2 is like some uh, combination of J plus and J minus. It turns out there is a basis that does exactly that, which is a continuous spin basis, okay? And that's where the continuous comes about, right? So, This basis is basically yeah, like that. it's a combination of it. and then the opposite direction is lambda. Bye. I hope you can see. So basically, there's a change of basis, which is well known for people who study this like continuous spin, and uh, I, I've never seen them employed in this uh, gravitational setup, which basically uh, turns out to be uh, this state here is an eigenstate of J2. So what we do is basically a change of basis, we go from lambda to phi, and then we can explicitly compute this big energy. Okay? And it turns out that this is just a two-line calculation that I will spare you. Um, is, this, is this a spin coherent, like is this like a spin coherent state or is this really one of these continuous spin representations of the Lorentz group that you have? It's really a continuous spin representation of the Lorentz group. It's the representation of I2. Like when you construct a massless representations, this is one of the possibilities. Unless you throw away the I. So what happens is that when you take, uh, we do this change of basis, so insert lambda with, uh, with phi, okay? Just like a few lines, but it's very simple. Then you get the following form. Phi. Okay, so this is uh, also a, a best of function, but that doesn't really matter for us. The thing is like, here we introduce a new integral, okay, over a certain angle. And this will allow us to recover the Fourier transform when we take the largest limit of our partial waves. Let me show you what I mean by that. So, large L, we said that this becomes that, so something like, D phi into the L theta. Okay. This part here, when you take the large L, the sum can be well properly approximated by an integral. Okay. And uh, allow me a little change of variables here, which is uh, uh, the following. So that, that yes. formula you wrote, I assume that's. Well understood for these big D functions, but yes, yeah, yes. But this gives like a, a more like geometrical and physical okay. picture on why we should get what we get. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me just do this little change of variables. But basically, this can be properly approximated by a db d. Okay. These are just the change of variables, and then here you already see how we get the two-dimensional Fourier transform. Because this exponent here can be rewritten as given to you after this change of variables. And that's why we need to Fourier transform in order to go to uh, uh, 
position space and recover this type of uh, things. Okay, the last piece that we miss to complete the derivation is this um, partial wave. Okay, this is like a um, basically like you project the amplitude in a different basis, and this is your coefficients. And uh, something that we know about uh, amplitudes in this uh, particular basis, they have they satisfy unitarity in a very simple way. All this partial wave, if you are asked to satisfy unitarity, they always have to be smaller than one. So there's a very simple general solution to this, which is uh, um, the following of uh, S, okay? Because like the module is always smaller than one and the imaginary part of this must be also positive, okay? And uh, so, we can basically wrap up this entire thing by saying that when we take L very large, what we end up with is some numerators that is fixed by all this approximation that we're making. And a two-dimensional uh, fully transform. And some function here, where after the change of variable, L will become V, and what is called the phase shift. And now, if we're working with like external spinning states, this would be actually a matrix, okay? Because that applies. And that's what really the current regime is about. Like that's how in the large, when you go very far away, that's how you recover the Fourier transform. And the numerator is fixed. And uh, also let me mention that this derivation that I showed you is actually valid up to theta squared. So in the gravity would be 2 p.m. If you wanna go further, there's like other approximation of the Wigner that you can use. And, uh, and this formula will slightly change, but everything is fixed. So you can actually like have a um, well-defined way of computing this object. So, this object is kind of like the dynamics. Everything I've showed you is kinematics, and uh, all the dynamic is hidden here, and this is called the phase shift. And it's like the object that it's used, uh, or one way of extracting um, classical observables is by using this object. That's how we can see the emerge from uh, partial waves. Okay, any question on this? There's a minus one. Right? There's a... In the, in the bracket. Right. In the bracket, yeah. yes, exactly. I did it for oh, S. Yeah. That would be S, sorry. Over I, something like that. Thanks. Okay. Good. Perfect. Any other questions? Can I ask a question? Yes. If I, if I would just blindly use a Fourier transform, let's say I don't want to go through the trouble. Is applied to use Fourier transform in B and call it the phase sheet. Would I miss anything? By... Well, already this N is a non trivial function of S, uh, and uh, so you would have to do it. Like, it would already be something. Also, I mean, people have tried to just fully transform a result like at 3 p.m., for instance, at theta cube, then uh, uh, yeah, you start miss getting some stuff. Like, uh, this n will change uh, up, up after 3 p.m. because this uh, approximation is not valid anymore. Also, this b will become slightly tilted when you go further. So if you just blindly apply the Fourier transform, you would get some, some wrong results. Uh, are you referring to the, this trouble that Veneziano and yes. company, <laughs> you have a resolution for that problem? I mean, yes, if we do it this way, like, this is comparing to Johannes Hen. And so, I mean, it's the one where you compare against Johannes Hen and, and there's some confusion. Yeah, so it doesn't work exactly right. How they define it, as far as I understand, they really just we transfer. Yeah, I, I think that's correct. Right? Yeah. And uh, we find that, like, if you just we transfer, this is valid up to 2 p.m. And then here it is going to. So, but that thing has nothing to do with 2 p.m. Yeah. No, it's not, it's not really p.m. But it's just, that's high level. That's usual, right? She's talking about. Well, but I'm wondering what she's referring to. Which, oh, to, you said. 
Yeah, which beat, well, yeah, which which, beat are you which, talking about? Is which, this the icon impact parameter or the yeah, exactly. Like it's yeah, is it is it this thing or if it was what was it? It was Johannes hand. But this was like the, the difference between the Sulich and and, and the... that's the one that yeah. you're referring. Yeah, and we've and, had and, like and, okay, that, that as far as I know, that hadn't been resolved. But you you say you have a resolution of that. I feel like I'm just saying that or, if we start from. Like from this perspective, the B that we get here is not the same B that you have at 2 p.m. And we match the, the, the result. You get the, I, can you, in the picture, does it, is the impact parameter the one that goes from the closest approach or is it the asymptotic one? Because the way you drew it right okay. now, it looks like the iconal impact parameter. And that's understood. Yeah, that, that part's understood. Um, but, but it's really this comparison to Johannes Hen that you're uh, referring to is when you said that there's some problem or is, is that correct or that, that yeah I'm just saying Johannes... like at 3 p.m. the B here gets a correction and we see this it's, it's, it's okay. has nothing to do with yeah yeah it, it's something I think you're talking about different maybe we're talking about different papers but okay when I, I can I would say, like, gladly for the transformation, as there's certain uh, order, then uh, oh, this doesn't work. Like, yeah, you have the, an expression that is not there, there is a correct, yeah, the B has to be changed. Yeah. But, but that thing is that thing is understood by those who understand it. But it, <laughs> it's, I don't know, we were very confused by it because we were like, we find something different after a certain order. And uh, yeah, there is a difference in B. At, uh, they have like some arguments why. I they, guess it's at 3 p.m. Like, here it just like yeah. emerged naturally. So oh, I see. I see. But uh, there's no discussion. Yeah, there are discussions of scattered around the literature yeah. bits and pieces. Oh. Yeah. We were just because like we did this approximation and we looked at what order things. You know, we right. got some corrections and uh, well, yeah. well, we can show you a formula, then you can tell tell us if it's the same as yours. Okay, okay, we can look at it. This theta three thing. What's this, this theta three, which doesn't match up. Or... No, no, I, I think it's, yeah, I think it's that. not that. It's okay. something else that I think he's referring. It's the definition of B, if I understand. Yeah, that's what she's talking. Yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, that's what you're talking. Right, and, uh, yeah. but that, that's like scattered around yeah. the literature. And also like a the, four PM, like yeah. the moderator was sorry, this is not change. Yeah. So. And some people have clear also not to see the exponentiation at 4 PM and so many for eight and uh, maybe then we think to check. Yeah. That's what you are talking about. Yeah, you that, that's the one, yeah. yeah, that's the one that, that that's the hen thing or yeah. the okay. Veneziano. That's and, what they, okay. That's and there's all sorts okay. of chaos floating around, but yeah. we, we can go through the papers Point to the yeah, chaos. Because and I, I find it very confused. There's a lot of results. And I, yeah. That's what we have, and I'm happy to like try to check. Well, it's definitely true. The literature is a mess. It's, it's like bits and pieces. Okay. It's not a, I don't think there's coherent descriptions, but. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, we can, we can uh, look at this. Okay. Okay, so now what I was trying to do is to move to observables. And here already you can see something, which is like, uh, now we, we have a way to, you know, we have introduced this new object, which is the phase shift, which is a function of S and B. And then you can ask questions such as, which points dominate this integral. And it turns out that when this phase shift is large, you're actually uh, dominated by a subtle point, which takes place, you can compute again a line, which is something like this. Okay, if you derive this, um, this uh, um, exponent with respect to B, and you have the first derivative to cancel, this is what you get. Okay? You can get other observables from this, for instance, the time delay. If you introduce an outgoing state, which is like shifted by a certain time, and then uh, you can again look at some of the points, and that's how you can extract um, observables in this language. Okay. Uh, yes, so back up. Do you use the amplitude to get the phase shift, or what is the order that you're? Yes, so I was planning to say this later, but I can say it now. So this gives you this formula gives you a relation between the amplitude and the phase shift. You can do the opposite exercise and ex expand this 
in terms of this. Okay, so you have an opposite formula in the opposite direction. And basically what you have is something of this form. The phase shift, it's up to some numerator in the Fourier transform, two-dimensional Fourier transform of the antigroup in the regime of small theta. Okay, because yeah. Yeah, okay. So this is the amplitude. And at this point, what you can do is go to the perturbative regime and expand both sides. So for instance, the leading order, what you would have is something like a leading order, let's say in G, uh, SMB. This would be the Fourier transform of this amplitude, okay, which is just a typo, and this gives you a log. You can do this in QED, and then uh, this would be just the, the charges to the enter. Okay. And then you can continue, and then you would expand the next order. Now you're going to have delta zero squared plus delta one, and then you can keep doing the matching and extracting order and order. Uh, okay. Okay. So let me just now move to uh, gravity. All I said here is really valid for any theory. You can do this. So every everything that has some long distance physics can be described in this language. Um, but let me move to gravity now, and like very quickly, I know you have seen this a thousand times, but let me just quickly mention what the scales of this problem are. So we have what? We have G, okay, B, and uh, basically the energy. Those are the only scales in the pure gravity. So let me start, write them in terms of length. So B is the inner parameter, then we have something that I'm going to call quantum wavelength, which is something that's one over square root of s, then of the combined system. Then, pressure radio is related to g square root of s, to g times the mass, depending on what regime you're looking at. And then we have lambda Planck, which is square root of g. Okay, so this is the scale that controls classical physics. And this is the scale we control uh, quantum gravity effects. Okay. And then we can look at correction, which are like ratios of those scales that are dimensionless. Good. The other um, uh, scale that I will need is well, something that I'm going to call like the gravitational coupling. Alpha G, which is what I was mentioning before, that comes into the, uh, the leading. Term, which is something like G times S. Okay, it's like the Schwarzschild radius times the momentum. And this is like the, the dimension is gravitational coupling that enters at every order. So for instance, this would be linear in uh, alpha G, this would be alpha G squared, etc. Okay. Good. Now notice that depending on the size of alpha G, this fixes some ratio between those couplings. So for instance, if your alpha G is smaller than one, you're in what we call the Saplankian regime. And then you have that the Schwarzschild radius at smaller scale, lambda Planck, lambda S. And on the other hand, if this becomes larger than one, we're Transplankian. And then we have the RS, it's larger than lambda Planck, lambda S. And so you already see here that if we want to be dominated by classical effects, we need to be at large. Alpha G. Okay. Okay, so those are kind of like all the ingredients we need. And let's see. Okay. And something I wanted to tell you about is uh, what I was telling you at the beginning, which is uh, how do we describe similar classical trajectories? Okay, because when we the, the join that I just uh, erased, it's really like a state which is localized somewhere in space and then it gets deviated by the gravitational pull of the other one. And uh, so we need some wave packets in order to describe that because just amplitude is like some uh, plane waves, right? And uh, so this is what I mean when I say semi classical. I mean that the size of this wave packet, or how much we can localize in B space, like the relative um, spread 
is much smaller than one, but at the same time, you want to know where the particle is going. So you want that the scattering angle, the error in the scattering angle, it's also smaller than one. Okay? So how do you get that both those are uh, small? Let me just do a very short derivation. So theta, I just erased it, but it was related to T and S, okay, the uh, Madison variables. So an error on theta is basically an error on Q over V, say, like the energy. Okay, now we know that Q and V are conjugate to each other. Okay, they're related by Fourier transform. So they have to satisfy the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So this is more or less that the B theta squared to that. Okay, now theta, a leading order in gravity, I haven't said this, but it's just the Schwarzschild radius divided by B. This is the small parameter that we use when we do this type of calculation. So this is RS over B. And RS times the energy is what I define as the alpha G, the gravitational coupling. So this is delta V over B, alpha G. So you see, if you want both of those quantities to be small, the only way to achieve that is alpha G being large. And hence you are in the transparency regime. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to like meaningfully talk about semi-classical traje trajectories. So here you need alpha G larger than one. And uh, and this brings me to like the very beginning, my comment on uh, um how can we resum stuff? How can we be so beyond the, the perturbative regime that we're actually using when we compute scattering amplitude? And this is the answer to this point of view. Let's say this is the energy, this is B. We saw that if you want to have some semi-classical trajectories, then you need to be on this side. Okay, you need to have like energies which are transplanting. But they um on the other hand, the econo, which is the derivation I showed you before, is valid for theta small. And theta small is when we are at the distances which are larger than Rs. And something I want to bring your attention to is that in this derivation, I never used any perturbative argument. Like, it ne never, I never talked about the coupling of your theory, right? This is really a result purely like kinematics and uh, um, unitarity and Lorentz balance, basically. So we have that the economy is valid in this region, and we need to be, and perturbation theory is valid here, and uh, we need something to be calculated here. But the fact that the economy interpolates in these different regimes allows you to extract or to compute explicitly delta, the phase shift here, where we can do perturbation theory, and then extrapolate it to the transparent regime because the color is valid in both regimes, okay? Which is, I don't know. I was happy when I understood that. Okay. Okay, then uh, the last, most, yes. Last comment I wanted to make is like, okay, this is the leading correction. What about the subleading ones? What else can we have? So all the scales that introduced are in the purely gravitational scenario. Okay, we just have gravity, and G and B and S. So what else can we have? We said, so corrections. So we have, we need to be transplanting because of, uh, uh, we want to have something adjustable trajectories. So here, R S and Planck and uh, the S. What else can happen? So we know already from this that we could have in principle correction that our uh, over B. This is what is called Kosmikovsky corrections. We can have correction that lambda Planck over B. This is quantum gravity corrections. What else? So this type of um, econal scattering at the very beginning was used in the 90s by Avati Benizano Cipalloni, which is by the string theory. So the kind of scenario they were looking at is with gathering strings where 
at some point, when you decrease b, you start seeing the effect of like the string being a size. Okay, so you can have this type of corrections. If you're scattering suns or like some planets or some object or neutron stars, then you're gonna have here some corrections that are related to the length of the object. When you go close enough, you start seeing that it has a size and you have some tidal effects coming from that. And uh, we can think of other scenarios, for instance, some scattering where particles in loop might, the, the wave like might be larger than RS and then you might hit those effects as well. It can be also quantum effects, but um, yeah, something I didn't say, I'm not taking any H bar to zero in this, in this scenario. No, this is still like semi-classical, but you can in principle have quantum effects to control purity. So all this I'm gonna call like tidal, which is like any other scale, uh, okay. Now the question is, can we resolve those effects? And this is like basically the same exercise that we did before. We could redo here. Uh, yeah. um, by asking that this correction that I'm gonna call like delta uh, delta theta is a uh, resolvable compared to the quantum uncertainty, okay? And what you get here, this is like uh, scary to you. Uh, P, G, and then it's correct. Okay. So when the, your correction is the rest of the B, you see that here you want something large, okay? Because you want to be able to like localize things both in B and theta, okay? So you want that this whole thing is large. Now, RS of B is more than one, but in principle, you can take alpha G to be very large, right? And then make the whole thing resolvable. Notice, this is quite cute because if you fix all your kinematics, you fix what S is and what B is, there's an N such that at some point, you're not gonna be able to resolve it. So there's a post Minkowski correction, which at some point is going to be smaller than a certainty of our experiments, and this will never going to be able to see. If you plug in a few numbers, just to have an idea, this is like 20 something PM. So it's not something we need to worry about right now, but it's a cute thing. If you do this for quantum gravity, you can actually rewrite this as the following form, uh, which is. Uh, This is just a rewriting of alpha in terms of uh, structure radius. I guess we're not seeing anymore. Um, but basically, you can easily show that both these corrections are small. And therefore, there is no way to ever see quantum gravity effects. They're always going to be smaller than the uncertainty of your experiment. So those you can see up to a certain n, but those are not resolvable. It's like a small exercise. Um, that is quite interesting. Okay, any question? Hey, Sarah, what did you use? Fast. What did you use for the resolution of the experiment? It's like it's a, it's a like yeah. the scale of the the size of the experiment, like the physical scale of the experiment. I'm just or, asking that like so. this ratio and times this ratio is small. Uh, because the ratio times. And this is fixed by all the kinematics. Uh, so your delta at the theta is for you to quantum answer Yeah. So it's like just that constant quantum. over one. Yeah. I see. Um, I'm just asking that the product of these two is uh, uh, smaller than one. 20. So they both can be small. That's the only thing I'm asking. Not making any more sense. Okay, 20 p.m. for, but there's some assu like there's some, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, so other assumptions yes, going to yeah. that. So, so what were like, your assumptions? Look, look at a, a rest over B with a certain power N. So here you can put like, I don't know, structure radio of a thousand kilometers uh, or like, we put like something like B is like a hundred times, uh, like some like random okay. numbers like this, okay. and then this fixes what N is. It depends on your setup, what PM you're gonna be able to see. Very good. 
okay, this kind of like ends my story on uh, uh, observables and corrections. Are there any remarks? And then to conclude, I just wanted to spend like a few minutes mentioning something that I've been trying to do. Um, I took a bit of an idea of how this could be extended uh, in the case of large spins. Because large spins have always confused me a lot. Like how, how do you start from like a, an amplitude which has a quantum spin and then somehow you're able to recover a curved black hole. And I, I was hoping to like, see this more explicitly from in this uh, formalism. And, uh, and the idea here would be to like, instead of scattering the usual two particle states, uh, we scatter some coherent states in spin. So we would define some uh, coherent state in a certain way. We start from a particle state and we define a coherent state of this, and then we can boost it and we can plug it in in all this uh, um, formalism, let's see. So basically what we want is like, I find that this is very sketchy, right? just to give you an idea. You wanna look at like how you scatter a coherent state into another coherent state, which is defined by a certain uh, direction of the spin, okay? And a way to attack this problem is to introduce a full basis here. One of spinning uh, partial waves. To this, like summing over all these states. So what happens is like this part here, we know how to handle it. It's what I've just shown you before. This like state they call the limit. We know how the Fourier transform emerge, etc. And then we have like some projection of the coherent state into definite um, angular momentum states. And it turns out that this um, projection here is controlled again by Wigner D with some different um, indices, but what happens is when you take the large spin limit, what you're actually doing is like you're finding some um, Gaussian that like becomes peaks around certain classical values. So you really see like how the emergence of the classical spin happens here because you're like, you take S large and then like the lambda that you matters is really like the projection of a vector with a certain cos, cos theta angle. This is really like the spin times cos of the, you know, of the angle of the objects. Shouldn't that depend a little bit on like what wave function, what spin wave function you're sticking into the coherent state of how exactly you're building it? I yes, mean, it's like it you does, it does. Take that in, right? Like you're not. Yeah, yeah I'm, like, I'm constructing like a, a coherent state as some of the, the standard wave, some rotation of the JJ state. And then, like at that point, I can like boost it and like do everything. I agree that like it depends how you define your classical oh, state. wave function, right? There is a link. In the yes, this is what I started with, like the standard Korean states. And then I'm trying to like see. And uh, basically what seems to happen is like you're really like projecting on a certain classical value here of this matrix that I was telling you about before. And uh, the reason why I think this is interesting is that there are new observables that come from here, like here, like such as like the spin kick should emerge as a um, a saddle point in this uh, integral, and there's also like this type of uh, little um, bases were not important if you scatter photon or stuff like that. But when uh, lambda becomes large with the spin, you actually introduce some um, other saddle points. That, for instance, relate like how much the plane will like uh, change direction depending Can you on. Can say again what is lambda one two and lambda three? Yes. Are there differences or? Yes, yeah, lambda. Uh, so these become large, like the the difference is the spin become... It becomes a spin peak, basically. In this limit, and then uh, you find some like other subtle points that relate really like the the. the rotation of the plane of scattering that happens once you, your spin changes direction. And it seems to be, I mean, I'm just saying this, this is like very finished work. I'm just mentioning it at the end to give you an idea of like some other direction that we, that is like, I don't know, trying to go to. And um, also to maybe 
Yeah. So, so we have we have an iconal formula, but we don't have for spin kick. Yeah. But we don't have a derivation of it. No. Yes, that would be a much better we... derivation. And I, and this is also becomes a matrix. Uh, and how this exponentiate? I found this uh, very mysterious. And uh, I think there's some stuff to understand. Uh, and I'd be happy to discuss this more. It's just like a very sketchy idea. And uh, something else uh, that I'm planning to look at is what happens if we try to introduce radiation here. Okay, do we have like exact solution of unitarity for like two to three in the limits where one is very soft? Can we like, I don't know. This is something that uh, also that could be an interesting direction to go. Okay, I guess I've taken enough of the time. Thank you. For your Yes. Oh, sorry to come back to that stupid point, but what would you do with the T-channel for gravity? Because all of your operations are in the fine. Yeah, I mean, like, we get a... And if you do... The like, or... you, you add the cut, I mean, I think the standard way of, like, adding a cut of... But then you... Space. Okay. But you I get don't... a log... Uh, I mean, you get a... a I get a rigid log. But that's... But, okay. Just, but then you can't like, use any of the results that are in the future, basically. Or all these because you're saying that I'm working in 4D? Yes. That's the... I mean, so extending this in the dimension without spin, it should be very, yeah. okay. pretty much manual because this becomes... I mean, that's been done. It's been basically done. Yeah. done. Doing it with spin, uh, I think it should be... No, I don't know. I have yeah, exactly I it's, it's terrible. Yeah. It's okay. Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> But in principle, this shouldn't be like an obstruction to physics, right? Like the way that we, the fact that you use dimensional yeah. regularization, it's like a good choice, yeah. but physics is not there. So I, I... So, so also these lambdas, you know, are you just saying you're scanning masses, external states? No, it's massive or masses, both, both uh, work. It's like the polarization, the choice of polarization. Like my phase shift is a big matrix, 2s plus 1 times 2s plus 1. So this is the J3, the difference yeah. of the J3s. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. If you expect uh, like a large spin to come somehow from like a quantum spin, then that's like the way. All right, well, are there any more questions? Let's thank. Sure. In the quantum setup, it's suppressed, right?